I've done this problem quite a few times, but it's so important and it's fun, so I'm going to do it again. So the idea is how do we deal with a mass on a spring? It turns out to be a super important problem that shows up in a lot of different places. So imagine that I have a, a spring and I brought a prop here. See, it's a spring. Uh, and, and I put a mass on there and I pull it and I let it go. Uh, and it's going to do this weird oscillation back and forth. How can I how can I get an equation for the position of that as a function of time? We call that an equation of motion. So I'm actually going to do that a couple of different ways. I'm going to do this uh, solving a differential equation, and just really briefly, not because it's, it's something I would expect you to do, but to show you that there is an analytical solution to that, and then I'm going to do it uh, numerically. So let's make this the simplest possible way that we can, and then we'll make it more complicated. So imagine that I have a mass, m, and a spring constant, k. So we call the spring constant is how stiff the spring is, right? So as I pull this, there's a force pulling back that way that's proportional to the amount that is stretched. And we call that the spring constant. So if I put this in just a one-dimensional situation like this, I can use this as my force due to the spring, which is a bad model. Okay, and we're going to use a better one later. But this is what I can start with. So this says that if I pull it over here, a distance x, then there's going to be a force pulling back the other way. That's proportional to uh, the stretch x because I started at x equals 0 and k, the spring constant. So let's set that equal to, uh, our use that with our momentum principle in one dimension. So I could say fx is negative kx. And remember, the momentum principle in two dimensions says F net is the change in momentum with respect to T. Actually, oh, I did that. I don't know. I was thinking two things at the same time. We wrote that two ways. We wrote that as the rate of change in momentum as a finite difference. And then if uh, we could also write that as a derivative and that's what we're going to have to use today. It's a derivative of momentum. It is a vector, but now we're just in the x direction, so we only deal with the x momentum. So I can say negative kx is going to be equal to dpx dt. Because right? that's the only force acting on it, if that's the only force acting on it. And that's the momentum. And so we define the momentum. I'm going to drop the x notation as just dmv dt. And so if the mass is constant, I can bring that out front. Um, in fact, I'll divide, well, that's fine. So it's going to be equal to m dv dt. And that's the derivative of the velocity. Now, we also have the definition that velocity in the x direction is the derivative of position with respect to time. So that means I'm taking the derivative of a derivative, which is a second derivative. So I get the following very important equation. And I'm going to divide both sides by mass. Negative k over m x is equal to the second derivative of x with respect to time. So what does this say? This is a really important equation that pops up all the time. We see it all the time. This says that. Uh, what is x? x is some function of t. But if I take the derivative of it twice, I get a, the same function back with a negative sign. Okay. Now, there are a lot of ways to solve this particular differential equation, but I want to just guess a solution. Let's just guess a solution and see what happens. Let's say, what, what functions, when you take the derivative of it twice, do you get the same thing back? Well, one of them is something that looks like this. I'm going to write it as a cosine omega t, where a is some constant, we don't know, omega is some constant, constant. I guess I should write that out. So let's just see if this does indeed work. So if I take the derivative of this once, I get the derivative of x with respect to t is going to be equal to the derivative of this. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So I get negative a sine omega t. Now, I have to take the derivative of the inside, right? Because this is a chain rule. I mean, the, yeah, the chain rule. So the derivative of omega t is omega. See, I left a little space there because I knew what I was doing. Now let's take the derivative again, and I get the second derivative of x with respect to time is going to be the derivative of this. So I have to take the derivative of sine omega t. That's going to be cosine omega t. So I get negative a omega 
cosine omega t, but then I have to take the derivative of this again and I get omega squared, right? Because I get the second omega. And so I'm gonna set that equal to uh, negative k over m x. And you'll see here that if I say this is x, then I have, this is equal to negative k over m omega squared. Oh, I'm sorry, negative k over m a cosine omega t. So this is true, the a doesn't matter. This is true if omega squared is equal to k over m. So this is indeed a solution. Okay, that's what I want to show. I know that's a lot, if you've never seen that before. Okay, let's solve the problem again. Uh, and let's do, I have the same situation. I'm going, that's my x equals zero, but I'm gonna pull it over here to some new position. Uh, I'll call that x1, and I'm gonna let it go. So I know that uh, x1 equals, let's give it a value. 0.03 meters. Uh, let's give everything a value. Mass is 0 0.1 kilograms. Let's say K is equal to um, 3 newtons per meter. I'm just making up stuff. And I'm also going to say P1 is equal to 0 kilogram meters per second. So if I have that, I do indeed have a force acting on the object. I can calculate that F as negative kx. Well, I know x, I know k, I know f. And this is just in one dimension right now. We're gonna do non-one dimension in just a second. It's gonna get awesome. So let's again use the momentum principle and say f net, which is just f, is gonna be negative kx, and that's gonna be equal to delta p over delta t. And this is all in one dimension, so I'm writing these as, this all in the x direction. If I break this into a short time interval, let's say delta t is 0 0.01 seconds, then during that time interval, this force doesn't change that much, right? So I, I can write this as p2 minus p1 over delta t. And I'll just leave this as f right now. Now if I multiply both sides by delta t, I get p2 minus p1 equals f delta t. Right, I multiply both sides by delta t. Now I'm gonna add p1 to both sides and I get p2 equals p1 plus f delta t. That's really important. This says that if I calculate the force, which I can do, because I know x, and then I multiply it by the 0 0.01 seconds and add that to my initial momentum, which is zero, I can get my momentum at the end of the time interval. Now we can do the same thing for velocity. So I can say the average velocity is equal to delta x over delta t, and the average velocity I'm gonna say is p2 over m. Right, I just calculated the momentum. If momentum is mass and velocity, I divide by the mass, I get the velocity. And then I can say this is equal to x2 minus x1 over delta t, and I can solve that for x2. I get x2 equals the same formula x1 plus p2 over m delta t. So this says that if I start with my initial position and momentum, after a short time interval, I calculate the force. After a short time interval, I can find the momentum at the end and the position at the end. And then I can go, now I have a new position, I can calculate my new force. And then I'll do my new momentum, p3, my new position, x3, and I'll just keep doing this over and over and over again until I get bored of that. So let's do this uh, in Python, and then uh, we'll make a 3D representation of it later. But I'm going to do this calculation in Python because I don't want to do, if I want to run this for a second, I'd have to do this 100 times. I don't want to do that. Okay. So I'm jumping over here to Python. Um, yeah. So this is uh, GlowScript v Python. I'm using Trinket.io. Let's make it a little bit bigger because bigger is better. That's good. Okay. So I'm going to make a graph. I'm going to make a very simple graph, and I'll make it a little bit better in a second. So I'm just going to say f1 equals g curve. Uh, this is a way to make a graph in Python, and I can plot a data point on there. Let's just plot to f1.plot. I'm just going to put some numbers. I need an x and a y value. So let's say 1, 1, and let's also plot f1.plot uh, 2, 3. And now I'm going to run it. And you see it had 
There's my first point. There's my second point. Everything's great. Uh, super simple way to graph. Uh, just so you know that that is going to be my graph. The other thing I need is my initial conditions. I need all those things. K equals 3. M equals 0.1. X equals 0, 0.0. What did I say? 3. Um, P equals 0. So this is all in one dimension. Okay. And I didn't put units. Um, you can put the units, but we don't need to do that. You could go up here and say uh, newtons per meter as a comment but I'm not going to do that just because I don't want to. I do need T equals 0, DT equals 0 0.01. Okay, so let's run a loop for one second. So I can do that while T less than 1. I'm going to just print T. I'm going to show you that it works. And then I'm going to increment T. T equals T plus DT. So this should run for a second and it should print out all the values. There you go. Okay. Um, let's save this because I forget. Let's call this S23 because it's spring. Uh, simple spring. That's fine. I will give you the code. Okay, so there we are. Now we need to do what we said. And number one thing is to calculate the force. So I'm going to say, I'm just going to call it F. F equals negative K times x. You'll notice that I didn't put x1, p1 because I'm not going to have a whole bunch of variables. I'm just going to change that variable, right? So I'm going to change the value of x. So I don't need to give it a label. But that's my force. Now I can update the momentum. So I'm going to do that. p equals p plus f times dt. So again, this is, this at the first time it runs, that's p1. And then it'll update the value of p. So with, that would be p2. And then when it goes through again, it'll go from P2 to P3 and so forth. But I don't need to label those. I can just change the value. And then we can do X is X plus uh, P times, oh, with lowercase, P times GT divided by M. That's it. I'm done with the, the calculation. All I want to do now is to plot. I want to plot position versus time. So I'm going to say F1.plot. On the horizontal axis, I want time. On the vertical axis, I want the position the end we're done okay so let's run this looks pretty nice um, let's run this for a little bit longer four seconds notice what you see here that is indeed a cosine function okay um, and in fact let's just make a second graph I'm gonna plot cosine remember we said the function should be uh, a cosine omega t, where omega is k over m, squared to k over m, and, and a, it turns out, would be the initial position. So let's, let's make a second plot, uh, f2 equals g curve, uh, and let's make this one red, color equals color dot red. You can give it a label if you want, but I'm not going to do that. Color equals color dot blue. Um, and then let's say down here, a equals uh, 0 0.03, omega equals square root of k over m. So down here, I'm going to calculate my new x value. I'm going to say <coughs> xc for calculated values, a times cosine omega times t. And now I want to plot that, f2 dot plot t xc. Let's see what happens. So remember, one is my analytical solution. I'm plotting that. And one is my numerical solution, which I just, I just did some simple stuff for. Wow, look at that. They're like right on top of each other. I love this too because I can change uh, the time step. Let's make a time step of 0.1, which is not very small, and run it again and just see what happens. And you'll see that the, the, the solutions don't completely agree, but they don't completely disagree either. It's not super bad. I mean, for 0.1 time interval second, that, I'm kind of excited. Uh, but you could do something like 0 0.05, half as big. And you can see that's even better. And then maybe I want 0 0.2. That's, that's pretty good. Okay. So I, 0 0.01 is the best. If you want to play around with this, and you should, uh, one of the fun things to do is say, what if I calculate momentum before I calculate uh, a position before momentum? Change the order of those up. It turns out this order works the best. Calculate the highest derivative things first, force, then momentum, then position. Let's save this. 
because I want to do another problem and show you how complicated it is and show you a better model. Uh, I'm going to give you two codes because I'm going to make it a second prop, a second calculation. Um, yeah, my th that's my all-time favorite uh, calculation because it's so simple. I mean, this code is not very complicated. I mean, it's really not, and it's so powerful. But it's going to get even more powerful. I'm going back to the paper. What if I wanted to do a more realistic spring? It's really not easy to take a spring like this and a mass and let it oscillate. Because how are you going to support that? I mean, if you put it on the ground, it's going to rub and there's going to be friction. It's not very uh, easy to do. What's much easier to do is this. Like that. But if I do that, I have now two forces I have to deal with. I have a spring force, Fs, I'll call it, and then I have a gravitational force, Mg. So I still have F net vector as delta P over delta T. It's just that the net force is now the combination of these two. So I have to deal with that. And so let's do that. But if I do that, I, I can do this. It's not too bad. I can still say this is P2 minus P1 over delta T as a vector. And I can still get the following uh, F net. I'll write the whole thing out. F net is, uh, I'll call this as F spring plus Mg, where G is the gravitational field, M is the mass. That's the, that's the weight. Uh, and then I can say P2 vector is P1 vector plus F net delta T. And then I'm going to say R2 equals R1 plus P2 over M delta T. So now I'm going to use R for the position, right? So you could have the, the uh, origin anywhere you want, and that would be your R, R1, R2. That would change. Okay, we're going to put it in the easy spot. The problem is this spring force. I need a better model for the spring force. Uh, I'm just going to show you the model, and then we're going to make it a little bit better. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that. So I'm going to say the spring force is equal to negative ks l hat. So l hat is a unit vector. So what we're going to do is to make a vector from the beginning of the spring to the end of the spring. And we'll call that the vector l. And then l hat is a unit vector in the direction of L. So it's going to be the vector L divided by the magnitude of the vector L. That's how we find unit vectors. Now what about S? S is going to be equal to the amount of stretch. So it's going to be the length of L minus L0. L0 is the unstretched length of L. So that's what we're going to do. So. <clears throat> We have enough to build this. I want to build this model using the same values, uh, but I want to make it go vertical. And so I'm going to actually just put this as y equals 0, because why not? Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to make this in three dimensions, too. I'm going to build a 3D model of that. And we do need to pick an unstretched length of L0. So let's say L0 is equal to 0 0.02. I'm, I don't know who's picking that. I'm going to release it unstretched. Right, so it should fall down and then I'll sit up and down. I think that should work. Um, okay, let's do that. I'm going to make some three dimensional things. I have a quick tutorial on three dimensional Python stuff. Uh, I'm going to make three objects. I'm going to make a point up here, which I'm going to call the ceiling. I'm going to make a mass. And then I'm going to first make this spring as a cylinder. And then we can change it to a. Um, we can change it to a spring looking thing if we want. Okay, so going back to the computer, uh, I'm going to copy all this code. No, I'm not going to copy that. I don't really need to. And I didn't even fix the graphs. That's fine. You could put, if you want to know how to make a, a better graph, uh, you can't. I don't need all that stuff. I just need this. I don't even need to copy this, but I am. I'm going to copy all this. That's all I need. Okay, so let's make a new. Uh, did I save that? Save. And let's make a new one. Let's just copy. Let's just copy that. No, let's copy. This is copy. Copy. Okay. I'm going to run it just to make sure it works. I'd always do this. And then when I save it, um, 
S23 vertical spring, 3D. Save. Okay. So now I'm going to get rid of, uh, I'm going to keep F2. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this. Don't really want that right now. Uh, T is 4. That's fine. Okay. These two, I'm, I don't really want X and P. I need to make some spheres. I'm going to make the first object, which I'm going to call the top. Top is a sphere. Uh, position at the origin, just to make things easy. Zero, zero, zero. Uh, I need a radius. Uh, let's say so. Point zero, zero five. I don't know. Uh, and then, oh, I need L zero equals what did I call it? Zero point zero two. Uh, so I'm going to put the second mass. I'm going to just call it mass. Uh, is a sphere. Uh, the position is going to be equal to vector uh, zero negative L0, right, it's below, it's below that, uh, 0, and let's make it a little bit bigger, radius equals 0 0.001, no, 0, 0.01, let's see if that looks like, okay, let's just run that and see what it looks like, I think those might be too big, yeah, that's too big, okay, so let's make this 1, and let's make this 0, 0, 2, that's fine, okay, let's make this one yellow, color equals color dot yellow. Um, now I need one more thing. I need my spring. And I'm going to use um, the spring as a, a cylinder for right now. So it's a, and I'll change it, cylinder. Uh, so the cylinder has two important op properties. Position is the location of one end of the cylinder and axis is a vector pointing from the beginning to the end of the cylinder. So let's say put the position at top.pos. I want to start at the top. And then I want the axis, oops, comma, axis is equal to uh, the, the final position, which is mass.pos minus top.pos. You could just do mass.pos because top's at zero, but you know. And then I need a radius of 0.001. I'm just going to try that. Let's run it. It's a little too thick. Okay. So 0, 0.05. Okay, I'm happy. So there's my my mass on the spring. It just, just the way it looks. And this is 3D. You can rotate this around and look at it from different directions and stuff. So it is 3D. Okay. So now in my code, I need to change this. Oh, I need one more thing. I need G. Let's put G equals vector. 0, negative 9.8, 0, right? That's the gravitational field vector. So up here, I'm going to call this Fn for the net force. Um, I need to calculate, if you want, we can calculate this. Fs is negative k times s times norm L. But I didn't, I didn't calculate L, and I didn't calculate s. So let's do that. I'm doing this in pieces. You could do it all at once. So L is going to be the vector. It's going to be a vector uh, mass.pos minus top.pos. It's a vector from the top pointing down to the bottom mass. So I can just use those values. They're going to change anyway. Uh, S is going to be equal to mag L minus L0. I sometimes get this backwards, so if that doesn't work, that's fine. So, But now this, this will work, right? Fs is negative k. S times norm L, that should work. So my net force is going to be Fs plus M times G. And it's plus M times G. G has a negative Y component, but I'm, I'm, it's the net force. I'm still adding them together. Now, oh, up here, I need to do some other things. So P is a scalar. Let's get rid of these. And let's actually go down here. Instead of saying um, p as a separate vector, I'm going to say mass.p equals vector 0, 0, 0. So that just assigns that property of momentum to the object mass. It's just a little bit better way to do it. So I'm going to say over here mass.p equals, I don't know why it's trying to run, mass.p plus not pp, f net times gt. And now instead of updating the x value, I'm going to update the mass. Mass.pos is the position of the mass, is mass.pos plus 
mass dot p times dt divided by m. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm not going to do, I got rid of that. Uh, I can't do this. This is common that all. Okay, let's just run it and see what happens. Let's see if this actually works. Something bad happened. I think I know what happened. Oh, you know what? I know what happened. Number one, uh, I want this to run in real time. So if I put rate of 100, it won't do more than 100 calculations per second. And I think I did get this S backwards as per usual. Oh no, it, it just fell. Hmm. Let's just try putting this backwards. I didn't, I didn't update the position of the spring either, but that's fine. It's just still awesome. Let me change that. It just falls. What did I do wrong? K is 3. M is 0.1. Maybe that's 2. Maybe I need to increase K. Let's see if I increase K. No? What am I doing wrong? L0. Mass. Vector. Spring. T. DT. G. L is that. S is that. Mag is the, the magnitude of that. That looks fine. Put that back as negative. Fn, Fn, mass P, mass P, mass POS, mass P. What the heck? Okay, let's see. Run it again. Okay, there it is. Oh, I just had my spring constant too low. Yay. Okay, so it was just stretching way down too far. That's fine. Based on my, my length right there. Okay, so it's working. Um, let's add down here... I want to move the spring. So I'm going to say spring.axis equals uh, L. Well, I can, let's just do mass.pos minus top.pos, right? Because I need to move the spring too. And there is your oscillating spring. Okay, I'm going to do two awesome things. If you want, I'm not going to do it, but if you want, you could plot position versus time for this. Um, and you can see that it's still simple harmonic motion. It still has a cosine or sine function uh, solution, uh, even though it has that gravity in there, which is kind of cool. Um, a lot of times they'll say that in introductory courses and not tell you why, but and I didn't tell you why. So let's make this spring a helix. Helix. Uh, and I'm just going to run it and I'll show you what happens. Okay. So it's there. Uh, the helix has a couple of important properties. Uh, I'm going to make the radius a little bit bigger, Let's put it, and I'm going to make a I'm going to make a thickness. The thick so it's it's a coil, and the thickness is equal to let's put 0.001. I don't know. I'm picking up some value. Okay, that looks pretty good. And there you go. It's a 3D. I don't know why it went faster. Okay, so it's a 3D thing. But wait, but wait. Let me jump over to the paper and show you something uh, kind of amazing, kind of amazing. So back over here at the paper. Everything I've done here is awesome. But what if I did this? Oh, let's, let's put it as a spring. What if I start it off to the side like this? If I do that, then I have the downward gravitational force, but now the spring force is pulling this way. So it's not going to oscillate up and down. It's going to change its momentum this way, and then it's going to do some weird stuff. But you'll notice that if I do everything the way I've done up here, nothing says it has to be vertical. I can just move the spring over here. I'm just going to push it over to the side with some initial position and let it go, and let's just see what happens. So I'm going to do two things. Going back to the computer. Number one up here, I'm going to put uh, this. Make trail equals true. So that's going to make the thing leave a trail. And now I have my initial position. I have zero in the x direction. I'm just going to give it a little nudge in the x direction of 0 0.001. Let's just see that. And then I'm going to let it go. Okay, I need a little bit more. So 0 0.005, 7. I just picked 7. 
what what is going on look at that and this isn't 3d you can rotate it around i don't know why it speeds up like that but that's pretty cool um let's give it a little bit more point one more i need more let's put point three there we go okay I, I can actually get it to move in three dimensions okay if i just move it in uh the xz give it a z value it'll just oscillate in that z direction but if i give it a z momentum that's what i want to do so let's give it an initial momentum in the z direction so up here let's put this at uh 0 0.1 i'm just picking a value to see if that works there you go so you see it's in three dimensions look at that is that not amazing that's art right there and the the beauty is I mean, the code's not that complicated. It's really not that. And that is a hard problem to do if you did it analytically, but numerically, it's not so bad. So, okay. I'm going to give you a link to two codes down below. Um, if you want more or if you have other questions about, you know, graphing or three-dimensional objects, if you ask me, I'll probably include more things down below, but that's enough to get you started. And that's the end.